so great to have you here at Columbia School of Social Work. You were here speaking with us a couple of years ago yeah. when your book was first coming out and yeah. you were nice enough to come and talk at our poverty conference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that book has been just a sensation. Uh, so can you talk about sort of what's happened in the aftermath of the book, the interest in housing and evictions and where are you going with that work and are you taking that work nationally other people getting involved yeah uh, yeah first of all i want to say it's such an honor and privilege to be with you jane uh thank you so much for having me and thank you for m so much for just being a force and a mentor to me yeah. you know all these years yeah. um so you know we put this book out and we put it out in a time where the housing crisis was getting incredibly acute yeah. you know it was growing from uh, something that affected uh, very poor families to uh, something that affected working class families, middle class families. Yeah. And now you, you see a situation where some cities are completely gentrified. In some cities, um, it's hard to imagine who, who lives in them anymore. And so the book uh, spoke into a certain moment. Yeah. And I think that, um, that people resonated with the stories of Arlene and Scott and Lorraine and other people uh, and seeing the, the human crisis or the human cost of the affordable housing crisis. Um, uh, reflected something that the numbers didn't. And so, um, so, and it opened some doors. You know, policymakers got involved at the federal level, at the state level, at the community level. Housing advocates that have been working mm -hmm. on these issues for years and years and years uh, finally had a, a bit, bit of a bigger platform. Yeah. And the book was able to kind of open doors for them that had been previously frustratingly and unfairly closed. And so it was kind of amazing to see the folks in Milwaukee, their stories kind of just, you know, open these doors. and. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about a few things that happened. One is, you know, we got the law changed at a, in a few different ways. And one of my favorite ways is uh, at the federal level with respect to domestic violence ev evictions. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a part in the book about domestic violence survivors being unfairly evicted because of these interesting laws called nuisance ordinances, uh -huh. you know, yeah. which kind of hold yeah. landlords accountable for their tenant's behavior. And, you know, we worked with the ACLU. The ACLU is starting a campaign called I Am Not a Nuisance, and they've got the laws removed all over the country. Fabulous. And right yeah. before the election, you know, we worked with a group of Democratic senators, and they asked uh, HUD for guidance uh, to put the federal law back on the side of domestic violence survivors, survivors and they did. And right. so, you know, we've had, we went from a place where, you know, we're just kind of doing normal social science to something that, that has had a federal impact. Oh, it's fabulous. I mean, I, I, I know from uh, personal experience there's also been an impact in terms of other researchers. Uh, so I think in the aftermath of your book and the uh, Eden and the Schaefer book, yeah. there was just much more attention among scholars to the issues of deep poverty. Yeah. Um, there was the Russell Sage Foundation, the special issue of their journal about yeah. deep poverty. and. Um, I think previous to that, uh, we all knew there was deep poverty in America, but it got less attention among social scientists. So I think that's also been an impact in the social science community, which has been fabulous. And I think it's been a continuing interest. And I, th I think that there was something in the New York Times maybe today about deep poverty. Just Angus today, Deaton, yeah, your Angus, colleague at yeah. Princeton, mm -hmm. wrote something about deep, deep poverty in America. So I think that's been another really useful, useful aftermath. It's a challenge for us, right? Because when we look at poverty um, far below the poverty line, um, you know, it's it's much more than poverty, right? Yeah, as, yeah. as we know, yeah. you know, it it sometimes articulates to violence. Uh, sometimes it has to do with drug addiction, generational poverty, housing insecurity, pain, just pain, just a yeah. body in pain. And poverty is this kind of collection of social maladies. And I think that comes with big challenges for us in the poverty debate. Like, how do you study that? Yeah. When all of our quantitative methods are about isolating something, how do you study something that, you know, the essence of it is this collection or constellation of adversities. And I think it comes with big normative implications too about like what kind of society do we wanna live in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I wanna be sure to ask you about uh, your other work on child welfare because the last time you and I yeah. talked, you were starting a very interesting project uh, yeah. to talk to parents who were involved with the child welfare system. Yeah. So I have to take the opportunity to ask how yeah. that's going and uh, what you're learning. It's going well. I think this was a, an interest that kind of came out of my field work in Milwaukee. And as we dis have discussed before, you know, a lot of the folks that are in the book had contact with the Child Protective Services, had had their children removed 
Uh, sometimes the children stayed in the system, sometimes mm -hmm. they came back. A lot of the folks um, hadn't had direct contact, but just lived in kind of constant fear of the system. It cast a, a big shadow over their lives. And that was a surprise for me. Yeah. I kind of came into this uh, pretty naive. And um, so I started looking into that and, and researching that. And I think that we, we know a lot um, about the child welfare s system on one hand, thanks to your work and the work of, uh, of other scholars. But there's a lot of things we don't know too, you know, just like how parents are interacting with the system. Um, how social workers make these huge consequential mm -hmm. decisions in the moment. Um, and so that's what the project uh, project's about. So I'm learning a lot still. I'm still in the, the learning phase and meeting people phase, uh, but it's, it's coming well. The thing I'm doing in between those two projects mm -hmm. is uh, building the first ever national database of evictions. Okay, so it's a national database yes. on evictions? Yes, so rumors wow. are true. Wow. The, um, <laughs> So, you know, this last year and a half, I've been on the road a lot and have had the privilege of talking to folks in like Grand Rapids, Michigan and Houston, Texas, yeah. and, you know, a, a lot of places in the country. And they want to know, what's our eviction rate? You know, uh, how are we doing? You know, how do we compare to cities that are like ours? Where, where are our evictions happening? Are they going up and down? What's the national eviction rate? We don't know the answers to these questions. And so I started a, this lab with this amazing team of researchers to get after those questions. And we have, at the moment, about 80 million eviction records. They go back to 2000. They're from all 50 states. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing right now is we're cleaning them or we're validating them. And then we're just going to publish them. You know, before we publish mm -hmm. the study, we're just mm -hmm. going to put them out there. We're going to put them out there in a web interface that we feel anyone could use. So if you're in Baton Rouge or Anchorage, Alaska or Omaha, Nebraska, you can go to this website called evictionlab.org. You can click on this map and you can look at what your eviction rate looks like in your city, mm -hmm. other cities. You can push a button, have a PowerPoint slides or PDFs for you. It's the idea of like leveraging the power of big data to take a problem mm -hmm. that's been in the shadows and move it in, into the light. So what about the other side of the equation? So I guess what I would call eviction prevention mm -hmm. efforts. Um, I've come across lately, maybe because I've been sensitized by your book, um, you'll see billboards or posters in New York City that say to people, are you getting in trouble on your rent? Or right. Are you about to become evicted? Call this number so we can help you before you get evicted. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some charitable nonprofits that are also involved in this space. Mm -hmm. So um, are you make, have you been able to make any headway in sort of cataloging what's out there and what's, what's the best practice? And what are the best policies in terms of preventing eviction? Yeah. Because it feels like that's the other side of the coin. Yeah. So for me, the best policy to prevent eviction is really simple. It's affordable housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, we need more affordable housing. In cities like this one, we need to build more or, you know, provide more affordable housing. In most other American cities, we need uh, better public-private partnerships, like more housing vouchers. So as you know, only about... One in four families who qualify for any kind of housing get it. housing assistance yeah. get it. I was going to ask you yeah. actually what the number was because we've been doing some simulations in New York yeah. City with the data that we gather for the Robin Hood Foundation, our, our poverty tracker. And I think in New York it may even be lower than one in four or maybe one in five mm -hmm. eligible households that would qualify for housing assistance don't yeah. get it. And right. I think most people don't understand that, that actually it's sort of a lottery whether you get housing assistance. It's not like food assistance or other types right. of assistance where if you qualify, right. you get it. Right. Um, it's really a lottery and there are a few lo winners and quite a few losers who yeah. don't get the right. lottery. So I think the problem is on the unlucky majority. Right. No, exactly. That's who we yeah. need to think about, yeah. the unlucky majority. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is the norm all around the country. And I do think that if you ask the typical American, where, does, where do most poor families live? They think of public housing. You know, they think they're in, in the projects. Yeah. But, you know, we know from the latest data that only about 6% of poor renting families live in public housing anymore. You know, 19% receive some other kind of help, usually in the form of a voucher. But the unlucky majority, 75%, receive nothing. And yeah. that's where the focus needs to be. Yeah. Now, in the meantime, there's other things that we can do. And New York City just passed the first of a right to counsel and housing court. I testified in favor of that change. I think it's an incredibly important, ambitious piece of legislation. So, you know, if you get arrested in this country, yeah. you have a right to an attorney. You don't have any sort of right like that in civil court. And so most families that get evicted don't show up. You know, I have a PhD. I don't know if I'd show up if I had to face off with a lawyer, yeah. you know? 
And so New York says, you know, we're going to stop that. We're going to have a lawyer standing between a family and homelessness now. And uh, that's a major change. And I think that's a huge um, yeah, uh, kind of a, a yeah. light on the hill. And Philly's taking notice. You know, Baltimore's taking notice. New York's taking notice of New York's leadership on this. So how much do uh, states and localities get involved in providing additional housing subsidies on top of what the federal government provides? So you're saying nationally, unfortunately, about three quarters of low income eligible families don't get any housing assistance yep. because there's not enough money to go around. So how much does that vary by city or by state? So in other areas of social policy, there's quite a bit of variation at yep. the state or local level. and states or cities even will kick in with extra EITC funding or yep. extra child care funding. Yep. Does that happen in the area of housing or is that a place where people just wash their hands of it and say we've got to wait for the feds? Uh, it's a bit of both and so uh, we do see some cities and some states stepping up to expand uh, federal impact. So Seattle last year passed a housing levy. They mm -hmm. passed it for the last 30 years uh -huh. and so they ask homeowners in Seattle to pay a bit more property tax uh, all of that goes into affordable housing programs. It's going to raise about $290 million over seven years. Uh -huh. um, and it's going to go to building permanent affordable housing. Oh, it's going to go okay. to putting, um, uh, to expanding first time home ownership and this emergency assistance, kind of like the billboards you talked about. To prevent people from yeah. losi losing their homes. That's right. So if you're a low income family or person in Seattle, your odds of getting ho subsidized housing will go up from maybe one, one in four nationally to more like. Well, here's the, here's the tricky part. You know, the, the, the cities that often are putting a bit of more of a, their foot on the scale happen to also be the most expensive cities. So Seattle rents have increased by 8% every year for the last yeah. five or six years. And so it's an incredibly hot market. Yeah. And so even that extra benefit, which is laudable and, 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 um, and we should take notice, uh, you know, still is kind of no match for the hot housing market. Right, so they're shoveling sand against the, hot, the tide. They're trying to just stay even because the tide is rising. Yeah. yeah, but one thing that's interesting and that's happening now is low cost cities are actually getting involved. So Lawrence, Kansas, for example, just passed a sales tax where all the extra kind of benefit will go into affordable housing programs. You don't think of Lawrence, Kansas as a no. super hot market, but they do have kind of a rent crunch like everywhere else in the country. And, uh, and so they're kind of getting involved too. And that's really encouraging. I mean, I was uh, at a forum recently in Boston and it was all about gentrification in Boston yeah. and big issue was housing. And I was struck really by how regional the issue is mm -hmm. because uh, the housing advocates who were there and the housing providers were saying for a long time now they've counseled people to go back to their community of origin because they can't afford to live in Boston. Mm -hmm. But now even the surrounding communities are unaffordable. Yep. So even sending people back to Chelsea or yep. Revere or Brockton yep. or Worcester, even those communities now are not affordable. Yep. So. Uh, yeah, I think it goes beyond the cities and at least, it for sure has to be at least states, if not national. So yeah. what are the chances nationally or is there any movement in Congress to increase housing subsidies? So I know we're in an odd yeah. political moment. Yeah, uh, I think um, uh, so you're the observations about Boston are really on point. You know, and I, when I was growing up, we used to talk about the other side of the tracks. And my kids are going to talk about like the other county. Yeah, the other know? state. Yeah, the other state. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I feel like during welfare reform, we were so caught up in asking about child poverty that we, we didn't ask another really critical question, which was like, what's happening to families? Like, yeah. who's minding the kids? Yeah. And, you know, who is minding the kids when you have a single mom that has to commute two and a half hours? Um, to go, yeah. How can you have a family under those conditions or, or a community under those conditions? Yeah. I think we need to start asking that. I think also the Boston example is how we should also start thinking about gentrification. And a lot of times when we talk about gentrification, we say Harlem is gentrifying or the U Street corridor is gentrifying. Uh -huh. And that is an important conversation. But what you're seeing in Boston is an entire city that's mm -hmm. kind of been gentrified. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a political economy problem. You know, Boston has one revenue source is property taxes. To raise the rate, you have to get the state legislature to approve it. Half of the city is exempt because it's a hospital, a university, or a nonprofit. Yeah. So, like, if you're the mayor of Boston and you got to fund the schools and pay your firefighters, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, you gentrify the city. And so, I think we have to think of that as kind of underlying 
uh, political economy that's like pushing this. Now, you asked about the federal level and what's going on. Well, I think yeah. you have to because traditionally this to. is where these large programs come yeah. from and um, the limited programs we do have are primarily federal. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I love that question. And I think what we're seeing these days in the poverty debate, specifically among progressive scholars and, and writers, is um, a tendency to fly to the local. Yeah, let's talk about the metropolitan revolution, what this city you're doing, that city's doing. And we can learn a lot from the local, but with something like housing, we're not gonna help the unlucky majority if the federal government isn't involved in a serious way. Mm -hmm. um, there's programs there that have general bipartisan support. Uh, the low income housing tax credit is mm -hmm. a big one where you know, you're kind of funding developers to kind of uh, build affordable housing in cities. Um, housing vouchers also have bipartisan support, but there's just not a lot of movement right now at the federal level mm -hmm. to expand those in a serious way. Yeah, and I think, um, I think until we stake the claim and make the case for universal housing vouchers, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I don't think we'll get them overnight, but I think we have to make the case for them and maybe then incrementally we expand. So in the areas that I work on, I've been writing and talking about universal child allowances yeah. uh, because we get, we're so <coughs> far away from that. Yeah. And, um, we probably won't get universal child allowances tomorrow, yeah. but it maybe helps us get more generous mm -hmm. child tax credits. And mm -hmm. I think in the same way, um, having the thought experiment of universal housing allowances maybe helps move us mm -hmm. towards more generous uh, or more comprehensive housing allowances. I love that so we're point. We're a long yeah. way away. Yeah. yeah. I l on the other hand, there's this growing movement around the country focused on this issue. So in California, for example, seven, rent control is polling at 70% approval in the state, not in the Bay Area, in the yeah. state. And so there's a, re and this isn't a comment about if rent control is a good or a bad idea, but this is a comment about there are a lot of people in a state like California that want a big change. And oh, so yes. there might be an opportunity for a grand bargain. There might be an opportunity to do something sweeping. Well, it is an important issue because the minute you expand housing subsidies, you have to worry where those subsidies are going to go. And if yep. they get simply get eaten up in increased rents, yep. then it's kind of counterproductive. Yep. Um, and it's the same issue around minimum wages. So yep. you do have to, you know, you do have to take it into account. And I, yes. New York has a proud tradition of rent control. And, yep. uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that it's it's a time to put a lot of things on the table and revisit things that previously had been written off, you know, um, as, as bad ideas or to speak like an economist, like have uh, unforeseen externalities that cancel it out. You know, when I started this book tour and I'd get a rent control question, I'd always say, well, you know, it's not really politically feasible. Mm -hmm. I can't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's caused me to kind of think, to revisit that research and say, okay, what do we know? And what don't we know? And what is, what is intellectual capture? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, uh, and what more do we need to, to know? So. I, I don't know. I think that there should be a lot of, I mean, the housing crisis can be and should be solved in a lot of different ways. I love your general point, though, about the floor and ceiling effect. You know, if we only focus on the floor, yeah. if we only focus on raising wages, we can see those wages recouped by extractive markets. Yeah. And so I think we do need a floor and ceiling uh, approach. So as you're traveling around, you're talking with people about housing, about evictions, are there other issues that are bubbling up? Are there other issues that you're hearing from people about? You know, well, it's all well and good that you're focusing on housing, but actually in this community, what about transportation? What about reentry issues? What about food security? I'm just curious if there are labor market issues. Um, what else are you hearing? Because you've been spending time in a lot yeah. of different places. Yeah, I, so I think the housing issue is something that, um, is affecting populations that we it, it didn't affect 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I was in Pittsburgh the other day, for example, um, and I was meeting with a bunch of housing people, you know, before the talk. And there were a bunch of public sector unions in there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what, do you, what, do you, what are you guys doing here, you know? Uh -huh. And they're like, you know, our members can no longer afford to live in Pittsburgh anymore. This is an issue for us. Uh -huh. I was in inner city Phoenix and talking to teachers and they said, you know, you know, half of our students that start on day one will not finish, uh, will not be here at the last day of school. We never knew why there was so much turnover, you know. And so I think that there's growing consensus mm -hmm. in a, the possibility of 
uh, kind of forming a, a coalition of the uh, un unusual suspects mm -hmm. around this issue. Um, hospitals are getting in on the business because they know that 50% of their cost, 50, uh, go to, you know, 5% uh -huh. of high users. And guess uh -huh. who those folks are, right? Yeah. They're, they're folks yeah. uh, that are unstably housed. Um, businesses, you know, are kind of recognizing that, like, you know, we can't attract the best talent because our city's really unaffordable and we can't, we have this unstable labor force. So that's kind of a, it's, so it's, it's a conversation that touches on a lot of issues because it's kind of mm -hmm. uh, there at the root of them. Um, I think that jobs are always part of the conversation yeah. and that's been something that's, that's come up a lot. Um, the kind of rise of the gig economy or what sociologists literally call bad jobs uh -huh. yeah. um, is something that people talk about a lot. Folks that are more on the conservative spectrum want to know where the church is mm -hmm. and where the community is. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've had a lot of conversations about, about that as well. Yeah, um, I mean, churches are such a resource um, throughout the country, and they have real estate. Mm -hmm. And um, they're informally sanctuaries mm -hmm. and places, you know, you see homeless people sleeping on their doorsteps yeah. and, and on their sidewalks. Um, and I know a lot of churches uh, and synagogues are involved with, with homeless people and with food pantries. Yeah. So it is a good question because uh, I, th I think they are quite involved um, and maybe could play more of a role just given where they're sited. Yeah, I think you saw faith communities uh, take a real leadership role during the debates about health care. Mm -hmm. And they, they kind of cleared their throat and had a moral voice in that debate. Uh, they've led with issues of of homelessness and hunger. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think they should lead at this issue too. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's so great to have a chance to catch up and so good to have you here at the school. It's yeah. an honor to be here, as yeah. always, as always. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it's always nice to talk. Yeah.